Now let's take a quick look at finance and nearing the close the Dow is actually up three points. It did briefly top 13,000 points and that's the first time it's done that since May 2008. Across Europe enthusiasm for the Greek bailout faded. The FTSE ended 17 points lower. The Australian dollar is buying 106 US cents. Tapas crude is trading at 127 US dollars a barrel and gold is trading at 1755 US dollars an ounce. Now, as the economies of Europe deal with debt restructuring in Greece, other economists are focusing squarely on the Middle East. They're looking at the effect of last year's Arab Spring and what it's having on economic growth. One of those economists is Dr Tarek Youssef. He's worked with the IMF, the World Bank and the United Nations. He's in Australia at the moment, taking part in a series of talks on social innovation, and he joins us from Adelaide. Dr Youssef, good morning and thanks for joining us. Uh, one thing that has been overlooked in the huge political and social change care of the Arab Spring has been the impact on the economies in places like Libya and Egypt. W what has been that impact and how are these economies recovering? Uh, I think the immediate impact of the political change, the unrest, the uprisings that took place in countries like Egypt and, Tun and Tunisia in the past uh, 12 months or so have been clearly negative. Uh, Tunisia and Egypt uh, find themselves right now in the middle of uh, strong uh, adjustments and uh, fiscal deficits, balance of payment shortages, uh, things that require funding, require help from the outside world and should that funding not come through, not materialize, this could complicate uh, the political transition and make it difficult for these very nascent, fragile emerging democracies to be stable, to deliver on the broad long-term development challenges. So I think I'd say for at least two of these countries there are immediate issues that have to do with fiscal pressures mm -hmm. and public expectations that uh, are becoming increasingly uh, difficult to manage. Why is that? Is, is it the case that economic institutions in those countries essentially have had to be rebuilt from the ground up? Uh, well in the case of Tunisia and Egypt uh, in particular it really has been about a shortage of foreign exchange. Uh, tourists haven't come a lot of their export industries have suffered uh, and meanwhile the expansion of entitlements on account of what has happened post these revolutions and the growth of public expectations and demands for immediate government spending have uh, led uh, to a ballooning of their fiscal uh, deficits in, at a time when uh, the proceeds and, and, uh, and revenues are down, not to mention the economic dislocation and some of the stoppages that took place in some of the important sectors. In the case of Libya, it is about building from scratch. It's about restarting, resetting a system that's going to be much more complicated, much more of a long-term challenge. But by and large, uh, all three uh, countries mentioned do uh, require a bit of attention, a bit of focus, in some cases a technical help to manage the immediate short term and to give them a chance at ensuring that the political change is one that is stable, one that is peaceful and one that can deliver on the high expectations and the hopes of the populations that participated in these profound recent events. You work very closely with young people and critical to the success of any economy anywhere in the world is the contribution of its younger population. A lot of the younger people in these countries have been neglected and disenfranchised for decades under the regimes in Tunisia, Libya and Egypt. How effectively are they now re-engaging with the, the new society in those countries? Uh, Certainly the young uh, people are uh, very engaged politically, they've been active. Uh, I would say they were at the forefront of bringing about the political change, the desired political change, and their demands continue to overshadow much of the public debate. I think the big challenge is in being able to translate these demands and hopes into an actual uh, reality with uh, the need to manage expectations, to begin the process of structural reform, to begin to take uh, into account the profound nature of change that needs to happen in policies, in institutions, in mindsets, and how young people are integrated, how they are included and given a stake. After all, they will make up the biggest demographic, bigger, biggest electoral uh, component of these uh, democracies. And, and that goes hand in hand with immense also political uh, implications for uh, political participation and the nature of populist politics that is about to emerge. I would say the issue that is going to be shaping uh, the peacefulness and the longevity of the political change is going to be largely be determined by how quickly the young are integrated uh, and by how much of results they see on the ground in terms of empowerment through jobs, 
through housing, through education. This is the issue of uh, the current generation. It's the issue that is first and foremost of the new governments in the countries of the Arab Spring. Okay, Dr. Tariq Youssef, thank you very much for those insights this morning.